we are going to work on the two strips that are seven one. So the very first question, or what we're going to write to, we've talked about a whole bunch. So if we go back to this drawing, and we spoke about you've got this hydrophilic head section on each side of the bilayer, hydrophobic in the middle with the tails, so any membrane protein that goes across. Those have two different names, integral and um, transmembrane. So they're both right here. They must have a specific structure to span the membrane. So that's what they're talking about. So we would want to put in some time, let's put like a little channel protein. And We learned the word for that. So when you have both hydrophilic and hydrophobic domains or parts of the protein, that's called amphipathic. So um, we would just put that these proteins must be amphipathic. Put our little buzzword under there. Um, to span the membrane. And then we could box off the parts that are hydrophilic and then maybe circle the hydrophobic tails. So they'd have to have the same properties as the membrane they sit inside or they couldn't fit in there. And they're not shoved in there after the membrane is already made. They're put in as the membrane is being made. Just remember that too, because that would be a really difficult, impossible feat to try to shove those in there, this hydrophilic part through the hydrophobic part to get it up there. So the six major functions of membrane proteins. So this is a test question. And this is one, so this is two. So just a little mnemonic, sick T for, you know, kind of helping you to remember. So the first of the six is they can do something that's called signal transduction. So trans means across, Duck means like um, some type of mechanism through. So this is the mechanism across that the signal does. So what these are, and we'll draw a little picture down here to make where we makes more sense. These are going to be proteins that receive a signal, which is some type of molecular signal, which is called a ligand, and they're going to change shape when that docks. And so at this point, these would be receptors. So these are membrane proteins. So membrane receptors. And they're going to receive a signal, which is molecular. So that molecule will dock with the receptor and when it does it changes the shape and that message is brought inside to the cell. Um, so this is what's called a ligand and it's going to change shape. So it changes shape. This is a word called conformational change.
that that's a word that lets you know. So the information is brought, conveyed, relayed inside the cell. Which is, that's the signal transduction part. So if you think about, and we'll box this in, if you think about it like a doorbell, your finger would be the ligand, the doorbell on the outside of the house would be the receptor, and then all of that mechanism that goes from the wiring outside the house to the wiring to the doorbell inside the house would be this conformational change that leads to the signal transduction, that doorbell going off. So think about it like a doorbell. So the next one, they're called inter, which means between cellular joining junctions. We just learned about those. So um, these are gonna be proteins that connect cells. So we showed before an example would be any of the junctions. So it would be tight junctions, the ones that cinch those epithelial cells so that there's no loss across the membrane and there's no sneaking through between the cells either. So tight junction, um, desmosomes, those rivets or staples that are made out of keratin, and then gap junctions. The actual gap is a protein, so those where you can actually share stuff across. So that's two. So the next one is cell-to-cell -cell regulating. So proteins are involved in regulating um, how cells know what type of cells each thing is. Like they present is what the word's called, a tag that's going to um, identify them as a specific type of cell. So there are modified proteins and they're gonna have with carbohydrate chains, these are called glycoproteins. And they're going to, they're going to be specific tags or markers. And they're going to identify, first of all, it would identify, you can't see that, as a human. And then it would identify you as your specific self. So these are the things that people have um, immune responses against when we have, um, when you do tissue. And so if you have some type of transplant, this is screaming that it's one person. And when you put it in another person, it's going to cause an immune response. So that's what these are. So these are the identification tags. And we'll come over here. So there's three of them. That's the sick part. Then we've done transport proteins before because we drew those. So there's different kinds. These are all going to be transmembrane because you can't cross and bring something across the membrane if you don't span the membrane. So they're transmembrane proteins and they can have different types of um, shapes depending on if the molecules move through with the concentration gradient or they have to be pumped across. So they're called channel proteins. If they're passive, so, <coughs> excuse me. So channel proteins are gonna be, um, they're passive transport and they're going to 
allow one particular molecule. So this is kind of the most important part. It's for one molecule only. So if it's an aquaporin, it's only for water. If it's a um, glucose receptor kind of transport protein, then it's just for glucose. So passive transport is always going to be from high to low concentration, and it's going to have free movement back and forth according to the gradient. So free movement of that molecule um, back and forth across the membrane according to the gradient. And this takes no energy because it's done just through molecular motion. So passive transport. Sometimes a molecule needs to come in even though it's going against the gradient. So it's gonna go from low to high. So this would be against the gradient. And so you would have to use energy. So it's not free movement, it's one direction only. And it's gonna be it's going to require energy and so you're going to have to use ATP to you're going to pump these molecules, ions across the membrane because if you think about it, if you have a closet and you've got it shoved, shoved, shoved full and you want to put one more thing in there, you're going to have to really shove to get something else in there. There's already a high concentration of these molecules where you're pushing them. So it takes energy to push that across. The next one would be enzymes. So these are proteins that are going to reduce the energy of activation of reactions. What that means is they're going to speed up reactions that would already occur. So I always think about it like this. If somebody walked around with the cap and I rock, walked around with the actual glue stick, eventually at some point we would meet like this. Who knows how long that would take? Like ridiculous amounts of time. So an enzyme brings the two pieces together that would need to come together and puts them in proximity, that's reducing the energy of activation so that what would naturally happen anyway happens much quicker. Or it would hold the molecule that needed to have the cap off, so it'd be a molecule that would be broken like catalase does for hydrogen peroxide, and it puts this torque on the bond, which is just an easier way for that bond to then break. So that's what enzymes do. Now. One thing that they do that makes things quicker is that they can be lined up in order in the membrane. So think of it kind of like a bucket brigade. So if the product of the first enzyme is the reactant of the second enzyme, then you've got them right next to each other. So they just pass that molecule along and so this is going to be much more efficient. We'll draw all this when we draw the membrane. The last one, you learned about these two with the whole extracellular matrix. So integrin would be an example. Um, they can also serve as attachment. So these proteins are going to attach the cytoskeleton and the extracellular matrix, and they're going to be bound tighter. They're non-covalently bound, and so they tend to stay fixed to one side. So one side, which is called peripheral, or they can be transmembrane, either one, which those are called integral because they're integrated throughout. So 
Um, I'll find a, some type of animation, but we do need to come back when we draw and we'll draw the whole membrane piece. So let me move to the next one of these. So I think I'm going to stop this one. Membrane proteins are those proteins that are either a part of or interact with biological membranes. They make up around one third of human proteins and give different kinds of membranes their unique properties. They help with both facilitated diffusion and active transport, connect cells together, participate in signal transduction, and act as markers for cell identification. Proteins are what carry out most of the specific functions of membranes, so the amount and types of proteins vary between different membranes. Membranes can be up to 75% protein by mass. Membrane proteins come in two flavors, integral or intrinsic, and peripheral or extrinsic. Integral membrane proteins are a permanent part of the membrane, while peripheral proteins are only transiently associated with either the membrane or integral proteins, where these associations are hydrophobic, electrostatic, or other noncovalent interactions. There are several different kinds of integral proteins. Integral monotopic proteins are attached to only one of the two leaflets of phospholipids making up the membrane, and they don't span across it. There are also transmembrane proteins and lipid-anchored proteins. Transmembrane proteins are those that span the lipid bilayer, and can be bitopic, spanning across the membrane once, or polytopic, spanning across it more than once. Lipid-anchored proteins are those which are covalently attached to lipids embedded in the lipid bilayer. For example, GPI, or glycosyl phosphatidyl inositol, is a glycolipid that gets attached to a protein C terminus during post translational modification. It acts as an anchor for proteins to the outer leaflet of the plasma membrane. Both integral and peripheral proteins can be post translationally modified. There can be addition of fatty acids, diacylglycerol, prenyl chains, or GPI. Recall that cellular membranes are made up of a phospholipid bilayer which consists of two leaflets of phospholipids. These phospholipids have polar heads which are hydrophilic, or water-loving, and nonpolar fatty acyl tails that are hydrophobic, or water-hating. Polar substances like to interact with other polar substances, and nonpolar substances hang out with other nonpolar substances. This really attests to the power of hydrogen bonding. Water molecules want to interact so badly with their polar buddies that anything nonpolar getting in the way of their hydrogen bonding results in decreased entropy. The result is what's called the hydrophobic effect. This is why phospholipids in water will spontaneously form lipid bilayers. These bilayers minimize contact between polar and nonpolar molecules, maximize hydrogen bonding, and maximize entropy. This is also why transmembrane proteins are amphipathic, which means that they have regions which are hydrophilic and regions which are hydrophobic. The hydrophilic regions are exposed to water on either side of the membrane while the hydrophobic bits are happily interacting with the hydrophobic tails of lipid molecules in the interior of the bilayer. As a result, transmembrane proteins are stuck permanently in the cell membrane and are very hard to isolate. To get them out, you need to add detergent, which is amphipathic and will disrupt the lipid bilayer. There are two basic types of transmembrane proteins, alpha helical proteins and beta barrel proteins. Note that while helix bundle proteins are found in all types of biological membranes, beta barrel proteins are only found in the outer membranes of gram-negative bacteria, mitochondria, and chloroplasts, evidence that contributes to the endosymbiotic theory in which eukaryotic cells acquired these organelles through the ingestion of prokaryotes. Transmembrane protein structure can be predicted using a hydropathy plot, which has hydrophobicity index on the y-axis and amino acid number on the x-axis. The amino acids making up a protein are localized according to polarity within its final structure, in such a way that the polar amino acids face the outside aqueous solutions, and the nonpolar amino acids are adjacent to the lipid bilayer. Transmembrane proteins can be classified by topology, which is based on the position of N and C termini, as well as start transfer and stop transfer sequences. For example, type 1 is a single transmembrane pass with the N terminus on the extracellular side of the membrane. Type 2 is also a single transmembrane pass, but the N terminus is on the cytosolic side of the membrane. How these different topologies come about will be the topic of another video. Often, transmembrane proteins function as gateways, allowing specific substances to pass across the membrane. 
they can undergo conformational changes as they do this. They might participate in facilitated or active transport. Facilitated transport is spontaneous passive transport of substances via transmembrane proteins. Active transport, however, requires energy. Active transport may be necessary, for instance, if a substance is being carried across the membrane against its chemical or electrical gradient. As a final note, in animal cells, most transmembrane proteins are glycosylated. These sugar residues are always present on the non-cytosolic leaflet of the membrane. As a result, the cell surface is covered in carbohydrates, which form what's called the cell coat. If you enjoyed this video, like and subscribe. You can also support me by following the link to my Patreon. If you have any topics you'd like me to cover, please leave a comment. In this video, we're going to explore membrane proteins. Did you know that the cell membrane can be composed up to 75% protein? So most cell membranes have about 50% or less protein. And proteins are there because the cell membrane uses proteins for pretty much everything that it does, all of these cell uh, membrane processes that it performs. So just to remind us what a cell membrane actually is, a cell membrane is made up of little things that look like this, which are called phospholipids. And they come together and form what we call a lipid bilayer. So over here, I've pre-drawn a lipid bilayer. And it'll look something like this. It'll be made up of a lot of these small phospholipids that we've drawn above, and it'll make up our bilayer. So you can see that there are two layers of these phospholipids. Now, there's two major types of proteins in the cell membrane. The first can look something like this. And this can appear anywhere in the cell membrane. And there are usually quite a few of these throughout the entire cell. So this is what we call an integral protein. You'll notice that it's called an integral protein because you can think of it like it's integrated throughout the entire membrane. Another type of protein that we might encounter might appear on top of the membrane. Occasionally, it might be slightly into the membrane, and it can also rest on top of integral proteins. And this we call peripheral proteins. And the reason why we call it a peripheral protein is because it's on the peripheral or the outside of the cell membrane. The difference between peripheral and integral proteins is that integral proteins are really stuck inside the cell membrane. As you can see in this picture, the integral protein is really inside the membrane. And in, as a result, it'll be very difficult to remove. Peripheral proteins kind of attach and remove themselves from the cell membrane or from other proteins. They generally are there for different cell processes. So for example, a hormone might be a peripheral protein and it might attach to the cell make the cell do something, and then leave. Peripheral proteins can also exist inside the cell on the cell membrane. Another type of protein is extremely rare, and it can appear inside the cell membrane like that. And we call this a lipid-bound protein. Why might you think a lipid-bound protein is so difficult to find, so rare, well, the reason why is because proteins are there to interact with the outside environment. And lipid-bound proteins are stuck on the interior of the cell membrane itself. So it can't really interact with the outside of the cell or the inside of the cell. So it doesn't really serve a big function in terms of the cell membrane performing its duties. We're going to spend a little bit of time talking about two types of integral proteins that are extremely important because these two proteins are found all over the cell and they help the cell maintain homeostasis or balance. The first type can look something like this. Again, this is an integral protein. What do you think this protein might be used for? This isn't two proteins. It's actually one protein with a hole through it. Well, this protein is actually used to allow things to pass through the cell. We call this a channel protein. And like the name kind of implies, there's a channel or hole inside the protein that lets things pass through. So for example, if there is some sort of ion, let's say this is an Na plus ion, a sodium ion, this is outside the cell. 
And the cell at this point really needs these sodium ions to perform a really important process. So what the channel proteins do is they'll allow these outside extracellular ions into the cell. And normally, these sodium ions wouldn't be able to pass through the cell membrane just by themselves. These channel proteins allow our bodies to take in different materials from the outside environment into our cells. What they can also do is they can also do the reverse. So let's say your cell has way too much sodium and it needs to get rid of it. So channel proteins can start pumping these out. Channel proteins generally don't require energy. So there's no energy needed. Sometimes we call energy ATP. And another thing that's special about channel proteins is you'll notice that it'll go with the concentration gradient. So out here there's a lot and inside there's very little. So it'll pump from where there's a lot of sodium into where there's very little. So it'll go what we call down a concentration gradient. Concentration gradient. The second type of very important integral protein is called a carrier protein. And like the name implies, it carries substances into the cell. I kind of picture it like a baseball glove, like this. So if there's a molecule that's outside the cell, and the cell actually needs this molecule, so what the carrier protein will do is it'll actually protect this substance so that it can enter the cell safely. It can also do this in reverse. It can take something inside the cell and pump it outside the cell. And this type of protein is really important because unlike channel proteins, carrier proteins can go against the concentration gradient. And this is really important because say your cell has a lot of chloride ions and your body needs more to perform a certain process. So what your body can do is it can bring more chloride ions into your cell even though your cell already has a lot of chloride ions. So carrier proteins can sometimes use energy or ATP. Finally, there's a type of protein that can exist on any of these that we've drawn here. And this is what we call a glycoprotein. So what a glycoprotein would look like is there will be a chain of sugars attached to a protein. And it can be on integral proteins, peripheral proteins, channel proteins, glycoproteins. You'll notice have the prefix glyco, which means sugar. And basically, it's just sugar plus protein. And the purpose of glycoproteins is that it's used in signaling. So it allows a cell to recognize another cell. So in summary, in this picture that we have drawn out of a cell membrane and several different proteins, we have two main classes of proteins. We have peripheral proteins, which are on the outside of the cell and they're really easy to remove. We have our integral proteins, which are stuck inside the cell and really tough to remove. We have our lipid bound proteins. We have channel proteins, which allow things to move through the cell by its concentration gradient. And it doesn't require energy and it doesn't require ATP. We have our carrier proteins, which are kind of like a baseball glove. It can take in a particular molecule and let it out inside the cell, or it can do it in reverse. And these can sometimes use ATP, and what's special is they can go against the concentration gradient. And finally, we have glycoproteins, which really can be any of the proteins that we've drawn out. It's a sugar plus a protein, and it participates in signaling, so cells can recognize each other. Okay. We'll keep going of the different ways that you could see those proteins help. So we are going to finish up 7 1. So it's going back to these tags that are on the outside of cells and they're the carbohydrates attached to the proteins and some lipids um, and they're not they're made as the proteins go through the Golgi so the membrane itself is made in the ER if the, there's like proteins that are going to be inserted that's done in the ER 
then all of that pinches off and the vesicle moves to the Golgi and then it goes to the cis face and it's going to be modified and then it's going to move out to the um, actual cell surface. And it says what's the purpose of these carbo carbohydrate chain modifications and on which side of the vesicle would they be? So we've done enough work where we should just be able to answer that. So let's just start off with that these um, carbohydrate chains, they are essential, they're key to cell to cell recognition. So how cells know what type of cells those are. And the way they work is, so they provide this recognition and there's going to be ways to vary the type of carbohydrate. So it's going to be what species you are, it's going to be what cell type, so it would be human, liver, meat. So they have all of that on there. And the way they do that is you're going to have varies, they're going to vary in length, they're going to vary in the carbs that are being used, so makeup, like which carb, and where they're placed. So if you have many, many combinations, say combos, that gives you a lot of diversity. Because think about it, you're unique at the cellular level. Like unique, like never anything else has ever been like you. So you'd have to have lots of combinations to have the level of diversity for that. So the way this would work is that the membrane and the protein would be made in the ER, the rough ER. The lipids are made in the smooth ER. So once you've made those, they're going to then be transported in a vesicle to the cis face of the Golgi. And once you have enough vesicles, you form a new cisternae on that cis side. And then there's modification that occurs all the way through. So then you would have modification where you'd add the carb chains, you'd add all of those pieces, and then you'd have this vesicle that comes off of the trans side. And so we'll look at what this looks like. So if we made this vesicle, now what I'm going to do is I'm going to just remind you with a little broken open section that this is a bilayer, okay, and you would have some inserted kind of protein here. Let's find what this is. So this would be an inserted protein that was done up here in the rough ER. So inserted membrane protein, and it would then have then it would have the modified carb chain that was done in the Golgi. So let's put that off of here. You might have some, um, here's your bilayer, you might have some type of carbohydrate chain that's attached to one of the lipids, so this would be a glycolipid, so you can add carb change to the lipids too, and then while you're making this trip to the cell membrane, you might as well put some things maybe that would be secreted. Then this is going to move to the cell membrane, and it's got the snare the 
loosely. And then you would have the membrane where it would have the T smear. And it would come to here, and then you would see something like this where it would dock. And then you have this now would be outside. And then here would be your lipid that would have the carbohydrate chain. And then you would have that integrate into the membrane with always what goes on the outside of the cell on the inside of the vesicle. So that goes outside the cell faces inside the vesicle. Four is a test question. So it's three, really, but for sure this is on there. How would you expect saturation levels of membrane phospholipid fatty acids to differ in plants that are adapted to cold environments and plants adapted to hot environments? What about animals adapted for cold environments? So what they're saying is this. When you have, let's just go back through, so you've got fatty acids that are in two types. There's saturated and there's unsaturated. Saturated have single carbon bonds. Unsaturated have a double or more. Saturated are solid at room temperature. This is what they're getting at. This is the key. The unsaturated, unsaturated are going to be liquid at room temperature. So that's important. That's the key to everything. And... Um, If you have a lot of saturated fatty acid tails in the membrane, then you're going to be more solid. So less um, fluid. So let's see what I want to say. I want to say if you have a lot of saturated fatty acid tails, that equals low fluidity. So when it's cold, you're going to want to, so therefore, when it's cold, which is low kinetic energy, because it's low temperature, you're going to want to loosen up that, increase the fluidity. So there's enzymes that actually change saturated to unsaturated, and they make bends. So when it's cold, the plants are going to increase the number of unsaturated fatty acid tails, which is going to increase fluidity. So this is when it's cold, and you're trying to deal with this low kinetic energy, which means that there's not a lot of movement in the membrane, the hydrophobic interactions between the tails are pretty strong, and it's making it more difficult for molecules to move across the membrane. Now, when it's hot, you've got the opposite problem. You're going to have too much kinetic energy, which equals too much fluidity. So you're going to have to do some things to make that less liquid. It's now not really holding together like you want. So when, therefore... When hot, which is high kinetic energy, what the plants are going to do is they're going to increase the number of saturated fatty acids, which will decrease fluidity. So this is not exactly what humans do. Um, so for animals, they're going to add cholesterol. You know what cholesterol looks like. It's that four-ringed molecule, a lipid. 
they're going to add cholesterol into the membrane, which creates space. Space equals fluidity. So they're going to remodel the membrane by taking and putting cholesterol in and out to change the fluidity. So when you have um, a need for more fluidity, you'll add cholesterol, and when you need to reduce the fluidity, it gets pulled out. Now, there are cold water fish they're able to remodel with adding the unsaturated. So they're going to behave more like plants because theirs is a much, it's an increased load, that cold water. So they behave like plants and they increase um, the unsaturated fatty acid tails to increase fluidity. So you know with the fatty acids you can have different lengths. They can be saturated, they can be unsaturated. The saturation places that where you have the, um, the lengths you can have, the unsaturated have different places where the, the bends are. There's a lot of variation. But in general, unsaturated gives you more fluidity and saturated gives you less fluidity. So that's the end of that one, and I'll see if I can find you a video about that. In the last few decades, researchers have discovered that the human proteome is vastly more complex than the human genome. Post-translational modification of proteins increases this functional diversity of the proteome, which is the entire set of proteins expressed by a genome at a certain time. The fact that there are way more proteins than there are genes demonstrates that single genes can encode for multiple different proteins. And the increased complexity of the proteome as compared to the genome is facilitated by many different mechanisms, including post-translational modifications, which help to regulate localization, activity, and interactions with other cellular molecules. These modifications can occur at any time during the life cycle of a protein. Many proteins are modified right after translation is completed, and these modifications help to mediate folding into proper conformation, increase the stability of the nascent protein, or help to localize this protein to distinct cellular compartments, like a shipping label. Other modifications occur after folding is completed and a protein has been localized to its proper cellular locale. These modifications serve to alter the biological activity of the protein, either by activating or inactivating catalytic activity, for example. Some other modifications serve as markers that target a protein for degradation. And besides chemical modifications, proteins can be modified via cleavage or proteolysis. The key thing to remember is that the proteome is dynamic and responsive to all sorts of changes in stimuli. And post-translational modifications are a common mechanism for regulating these cellular activities. Now, there are many, many types of post-translational modifications, so I'll go over only the most common ones here. And let's start with methylation. Methylation involves the transfer of one carbon methyl groups to amino acid side chains by methyl transferases using S-adenosyl methionine, or SAM, as the primary methyl group donor. This can neutralize a negative amino acid charge when bound to carboxylic acids and leads to increased hydrophobicity of the protein. A well-known use for methylation is epigenetic regulation of transcription. Histone methylation and demethylation can alter the availability of DNA for transcription. Another type of protein modification is acetylation, specifically to nitrogen atoms on a protein, so N-acetylation which occurs as a nascent protein is being translated. The N-terminal methionine on the growing polypeptide chain is cleaved by methionine aminopeptidase and then replaced by an acetyl group donated by acetyl-CoA via an enzyme called N-acetyltransferase. Up to 90% of eukaryotic proteins are acetylated this way, though the biochemical significance of this modification remains to be known. Acetylation also occurs on the lysine residues of histones via the action of histone acetyltransferases. And this is also used to alter transcription in a similar manner to that of methylation. 
The acetylation of histones helps to promote transcription by reducing the chromosomal condensation around these proteins. The next post-translational modification that can occur to proteins is called glycosylation, and it is one of the most significant types of post-translational modifications because it has implications on protein folding and conformation, distribution, stability, and also activity. Glycosylation involves the addition of a diverse array of sugar moieties and ranges from simple monosaccharide modifications of transcription factors to highly, highly complex branched polysaccharide modifications of cell surface receptors. These carbohydrates can be added to the nitrogen atom in the side chain of asparagine residues, those are N-linked, or to the oxygen atom in the side chains of serine or threonine residues, these are O-linked. These types of glycosylation changes these types of glycosylation changes form major structural components of cell surface and secreted proteins. The next modification, lipidation, is a post-translational modification employed to target proteins to particular membrane-bound organelles, such as the endoplasmic reticulum, Golgi apparatus, or mitochondria. It is also used to target proteins to endosomes, lysosomes, and the plasma membrane. Two types of lipidation modifications are GPI anchors and S palmitoylation. C terminal glycosyl phosphatidyl inositol, or GPI anchors, help to tether proteins bound to the plasma membrane of the cell surface. These hydrophobic moieties are prepared in the endoplasmic reticulum where they are added to nascent proteins and used to localize cell surface proteins to cholesterol or sphingolipid rich areas in the plasma membrane. S palmitoylation involves the addition of 16 carbon long palmitoyl groups to thiolate side chains of cysteine residues. This modification adds a long hydrophobic chain that can be used in a similar manner as a GPI anchor. It helps to anchor proteins in the hydrophobic cell membrane. Next is ubiquitination, which is a protein modification used to target proteins for degradation. Ubiquitin is a polypeptide consisting of 76 amino acids that is attached to lysine residues of target proteins via the C-terminal glycine of ubiquitin. Polyubiquinated proteins are recognized by the 26S proteasome, which is an enzyme that catalyzes the degradation of the protein and the recycling of the ubiquitin. Next up is one of the most common post-translational modifications that you'll come across, and that's phosphorylation, which is a reversible modification that occurs principally on serine, threonine, or tyrosine residues, and is used to regulate proteins that play a role in a vast array of cellular processes, including signal transduction pathways, the cell cycle, cell growth, and apoptosis. Protein kinases are the enzymes that help facilitate the phosphate group transfer, and phosphorylases help to remove them. And lastly, enzymes called proteases may remove amino acids from the amino end of the protein or cut the peptide chain in the middle, a process known as proteolysis. One example of this is the peptide hormone insulin, which is cut twice after disulfide bonds are formed, and a propeptide is removed from the middle of the chain. The resulting protein consists of two polypeptide chains connected by disulfide bonds. Proteases also play roles in cell signaling, antigen processing, and apoptosis. Proteins move from the endoplasmic reticulum to the Golgi apparatus. Soluble proteins are carried inside vesicles, and membrane-bound proteins are carried in their membranes. Vesicles bud from the ER and move toward the Golgi cisface. This vesicle is carrying soluble proteins proteins not associated with the membrane. The vesicle fuses with the Golgi apparatus, delivering the proteins to the Golgi lumen. Another vesicle pinches off the ER, carrying proteins in its membrane. It also moves to the Golgi apparatus, and when its membrane fuses with the Golgi apparatus, the proteins it carries remain in the Golgi membrane. In reality, Vesicles bearing membrane proteins may also carry soluble proteins that are recycled back to the ER if they are not ready for processing in the Golgi apparatus.
Proteins targeted to organelles, such as the endosome, cellular membranes, or for extracellular secretion, must be modified. The modification is necessary for the correct delivery of the protein to its final cellular location. The modification occurs when specific sugar molecules are added to a core oligosaccharide that is attached to the protein. These sugar complexes are the signal often required to direct the protein to its final destination. One example of this is mannose-6-phosphate. These sugar side chain modifications occur within the Golgi apparatus. We focus here on the delivery of a hydrolase enzyme to the endosome. Hydrolases are enzymes that degrade other molecules. The endosome is an organelle that contains molecules to be degraded. Other key components include the M6B receptor protein. So let's follow a hydrolase from the endoplasmic reticulum, or ER, where it is synthesized, to the endosome. First, the hydrolase is delivered from the ER to the Golgi apparatus via a vesicle. While it is being transferred through the ER and cis-cisterna of the Golgi apparatus, the modification of the sugar core oligosaccharide begins. The term for this process is glycosylation. Here we show two steps involved in the production of the mannose-6-phosphate signal. In humans, defects in Golgi glycosylation can lead to specific diseases. Once the hydrolase reaches the trans-Golgi cisternae, the mannose-6-phosphate signal has been completed. Only proteins destined for the endosome have the mannose-6-phosphate signal. Once modified, the hydrolase is bound to the mannose-6 receptor protein through the mannose-6-phosphate molecule. The receptor has a domain that extends through the trans-Golgi membrane. Through the interaction with this receptor, the hydrolase is associated with the trans-Golgi membrane. Next, a vesicle containing the hydrolase buds off from the trans-Golgi and moves to the endosome. Endosomes eventually mature into lysosomes. Other proteins have different sugar side chains, and they are delivered to other cellular locations, or to the cell membrane where it is embedded or secreted. The vesicle docks and fuses with the endosome. At this point, the hydrolase is released. Soon after, the phosphate portion of the mannose-6-phosphate signal is removed. Before it can go on to degrade other molecules, the hydrolase will undergo a final modification to become an active enzyme. The M6P receptors are then recycled back to the Golgi. The sugar side chain signal added by glycosylation in the Golgi apparatus is a key element of the process that directs certain proteins to their proper cellular locations.